All right, well, hello everyone. I have uh, what's probably going to be a little bit of a longer video here today. We'll see how it goes. But um, I really just wanted to lay out my worldview, and I guess I use that word kind of literally in the sense of uh, what has happened to the Earth. This is a history of the Earth. Uh, now, some of it is quite solid and rooted in. Um, a biblical cosmology as laid out by God's Word, the Bible. And then some of it is more speculative and just things that I have observed or puzzle pieces that I've put together in a certain way, but using a, a biblical worldview and biblical reasoning to do that. And uh, so you're probably not going to agree with everything in, in this video, but we're going to cover enough interesting stuff that I will leave you with a ton of breadcrumbs for you to follow up on if you're interested in any of these peripheral topics. And uh, so hang in there too if you're not someone who's a Christian or a Bible believer or interested in the Bible because we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, some of these topics have deep implications for us even in the modern world. And uh, I think you will find that this perspective of things is at the very least interesting. Um, now, uh, I love science, but I'm not a scientist. I love history. I'm not really a historian, though, either, even though uh, that's what I studied in school. Um, I'm just a, a truther who likes learning about stuff and uh, thinking about things and digging for things that uh, most people haven't investigated. All right, so anyway, um, let's go ahead and go here and start first. So things start off with the creation week, and understand that in a biblical cosmology, if you're really taking the Bible at his word, at its word, um, there's genealogies in the Bible, and if you piece those together, uh, so we know that 2,000 years ago uh, was when Christ walked the earth, and um, and then we have uh, we have genealogies that lead us from Adam to Christ. Now there's some gaps that need to be filled in here and there, um, and so you know there's it's not a perfect chronology, but the creation week took place about six thousand years ago, and that's pretty that's a pretty solid estimate. Um, we might call it you know six, we might call it seven thousand years somewhere in there, but it's about six thousand years, and that's that's a pretty solid timeline. Now, if you hold to a Big Bang cosmology, um, which is a religious system, I've talked about that before, um, no one can prove that the Big Bang took place, and it didn't. It's actually a nonsensical uh, religious pseudoscience, really, uh, and the Bible warns us to be careful of science falsely so-called, of pseudoscience and religion that's being pushed on us uh, but as if it were science, as if it's solid and reliable when it really isn't. Um, anyway, so the Bible does teach that there was a creation week, in uh, a literal week of seven 24-hour days in which the Creator God um, created everything. Now, He created it in six days and rested on the seventh, and it wasn't that God, you know, an omnipotent being, needed to rest or anything like that. He's laying out a pattern and a foundation for how we were to structure our lives. That there was to be a time of work, and human beings were created to work. We are given stewardship over the earth and over the animals. You can read about that in Genesis. That's one of our purposes. Uh, but then we also need to take time and set that aside for fellowship with, with God and for resting. And um, and we see that in the scriptures as well. This is God establishing a pattern for humanity. Uh, when you really dig down into the creation account in Genesis, the Bible is not a heliocentric book. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't set forth the solar system with these other planets, and Earth is not a spinning space ball in the scriptures. We never see that. The Bible is very clear that the Earth is fixed and immovable, that it has an established place, that the sun moves in a circuit over the earth, that the sun and the moon are local to the earth, and that there is a firmament structure over the atmosphere or the first heaven 
uh, and that structure is solid. And beyond that are uh, the other heavens. And um, so let's talk about some of this stuff. Um, and I do have some illustrations on some of these things as well to kind of help you visualize maybe a little bit of what's going on. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit here about the firmament, Genesis 1, verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So he's creating a firmament in the middle of the waters. A firmament, uh, firm, is right there in the word. It's a structure, and it's in the midst of waters, dividing waters from waters. Um, a good way to describe this is God's creating a bubble. Um, because we do see earlier on in the scriptures that darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So at the beginning of things there was a surface of water and then God is uh, further separating that water. And um, here's a few images that might kind of help illustrate that. So we have the great deep, here's the waters, and then God is using this firmament. He's creating a little bubble to separate waters from waters. Um, and there is water above the firmament, up above us. And then, of course, there's water down below us. We know that, uh, you know, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. And uh, let's look at some of these Bible verses, because I'm hoping that this will sort of, uh, you know, over time there have been these different cosmologies and these different um, depictions of a biblical cosmology, and they vary a little bit um, here and there. Uh, but I want to kind of give you the Bible on some of this stuff so that you can see this isn't just conjecture, this isn't just me making this stuff up, or flat earthers making this stuff up. Um, this is actually a biblical worldview. Uh, the Bible, I believe, is a flat earth book, and I believe that that's actually the reality that we live in. All right, so 2 Peter 3, 5. So this is talking about people in the end times. They're going to be very skeptical of spiritual things. They're going to start mocking uh, Christians saying, you know, God promised to return. Where is he? Where's Jesus? And, uh, and they hold to a uniformitarianism. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Well, that's actually not true. Uh, the Bible lays forth a cataclysmic uh, view of history, which is that there have been certain major cataclysms that have shaped our world, and that's a good part of what we're going to be talking about in this video. Um, and even those who hold to a Big Bang cosmology, vast eons of time and uniform forces, uniformitarianism, they still hold to cataclysm, uh, concepts of cataclysm on certain levels. For example, the Big Bang itself was a one-time event. You could call that a cataclysm. Uh, so there's a little bit of hypocrisy here, saying all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Um, anyway, but 2 Peter 3, 5 says this, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So earth is not only standing out of the water, but it's in the water. And this is illustrated very well by, you know, something like this. Um, where we see, and even just looking at the a surface map of the earth, you see the land. It is in the water, but it's, you know, standing up out of the water. This is what the Bible says, and God specifically created it that way. Um whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So, um, the heavens and earth that exist right now, um, there is a future judgment reserved for them. Now, God promised he was never going to judge the earth again by flooding it. The next judgment will be by fire, in which the elements will melt with a fervent heat, the Bible says. And actually, we're heading towards a time when the sun is going to burn so intensely that men will curse God because of the pain and suffering of the intense rays of the sun. Um, and all this is tied into human geoengineering and uh, 
what's going on with global warming. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the video and things like that. We are heading in that direction. Um, things are anyway. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of this stuff. So the sun, okay, let me pull up another map for you. So these are, are older illustrations and conceptions of the universe from fairly old works like 100 years ago or whatever. And, uh, you know, notice that you have a solid firmament structure. It does have features like windows. Um, and then at one point, I believe it was Jacob, Jacob's ladder, he saw angels ascending and descending. Now, the Bible calls it like a, a ladder, but uh, was he seeing more of like a, a science fiction, um, you know, uh, teleporter beam, um, transporting ang angelic, you know, spiritual beings up and down to do God's will in the earth. Hard to say exactly what, you know, it, an elevator uh, or an energetic elevator um, versus a ladder because you know an elevator is kind of a form of a ladder in a sense um, but anyway we see here that the atmosphere or the heavens underneath the firmament um, you've got a sun and our moon making circuits there and then the uh, many of the ancients believed in what was called the eighth celestial sphere um, so they believed in these celestial spheres which the spheres were not physical they were the um, the orbits of the planetary bodies, or I should say the heavenly bodies around the sun, um, their circuits around the sun. And, uh, but then the eighth celestial sphere was seen as, as solid, as a solid structure into which the, the stellae fixae or the fixed stars were studded. And that is the biblical firmament. And there are many cultures that believed in this eighth celestial sphere. And I actually have um, an old book uh, that has writings of astronomers like um, Galileo, uh, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, and, uh, and many of them, many of them talk about the eighth celestial sphere. Uh, this is um, something that people believed in for a long time, thousands and thousands of years before the heliocentric religion came around uh, and was mixed with science into this new scientism that has become sort of our science religion of, uh, of the modern era. Let me show you some other images though that illustrate kind of what... Uh, uh, so these images are from the flatearthpodcast.com which has a lot of good information on, on it. Um, I will say though that there's some, you have to use some discernment because it's not all, not all good stuff. Um, this app is pretty cool for the phone. It shows uh, the time because the clock and the sundial were most likely inspired by the true face of our Earth, which is a flat disk-like, uh, it's the azimuthal equidistant map projection. And uh, the sun goes around, and so that's the hour hand, and the moon goes around to mark the moons, the, the months. And this app visualizes all that stuff and shows you where the day and night divisions are and so forth, and it's really wild. And um, the sun, uh, here we go. The sun, as it makes its circuits, is not just staying at a, the same distance from the North Pole. It is moving in and out between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn as it goes. So it's kind of making a spirograph sort of shape almost, weaving in and out. And that's where our seasons come from. Uh, when the sun is in the northern hemisphere, um, closer to the Tropic of Cancer, uh, we have summer, you know, in the northern hemisphere, the inner circle. And then when it's down towards the Tropic of Capricorn on the other side of the equator, further out, we have winter and this is why the earth is not uniformly lit there are periods um, at the North Pole where they have daylight 24 hours the reason is the Sun's close enough that it's the light that it's projecting reaches the North Pole 24 7 and then there's periods of darkness where the Sun's far enough out that the northern reaches never get that sunlight because understand, the sun's uh, light, it's like a lamp. It doesn't have an infinite range. It projects that light outwards through dust, water vapor, and just distance. And the darkness 
uh, that hangs over the world system. Um, it's dark. And so there's sort of like, it's not, I wouldn't describe it as a flashlight shining down. I just, I, I do believe that the sun is spherical, but it's radiating this, this, um, this radius of illumination around it as it moves. And uh, the shape of the illumination on the Earth varies according to the seasons. It's more rounded when the sun is more towards the middle. But when the sun gets out towards the edges of the firmament structure, something happens where you get these kind of wings around the periphery. Um, and that's likely due to uh, the sun and the firmament structure interacting with each other. But this is kind of what uh, modern flat earthers believe. So we have an azimuthal equidistant projection. The North Pole's in the center here. And Antarctica is not a continent. At the bottom of a globe, it is a ring surrounding the Earth. And then sun and moon are making circuits over the Earth. So let's talk about those circuits. Uh, let's go to Psalm 19.6. Psalm 19, verse 6. Uh, so this is talking about the sun. Going back to verse 4. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from one end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Now that's, that last statement is really interesting. There is no thing hid from the heat of the sun. I will say this, I do not believe in an infinite universe full of other solar systems and other planets. I believe that the creation is more localized uh, and more of a handiwork of God. He has a specific plan for the specific creation that he's made. Earth is a habitation for humanity. We're not meant to go to other worlds. There are no other worlds. There was a spiritual realm and eventually we will some of us will see that. Uh, but in this life, we are confined to the earth realm. It's the habitation God's established for us. And the going forths of the sun are from one end of the heaven, and he's making a circuit unto the ends of it. Um, this is what we see in these, these visualizations. Uh, and the Bible says nothing's hid from the heat of it. In other words, the material creation all of the material creation is heated by the sun. That to me says that uh, there is no infinite universe out there. And it also says to me that um, creation's done. You know, Big Bang cosmology says that the, the universe is still expanding, that stars are still being formed from nebula, which are these gas clouds or stellar nurseries that are spitting out stars. I don't believe any of that. Uh, the Bible lays out the sun as being very distinct from the stars and uh, says that everything is subject to the heat of the sun. Everything, everything that exists is uh, in the physical realm is warmed by the sun's rays. That means that uh, the physical creation is more localized and more of a, an intimate handiwork of God. And that's not to diminish God's power in any sense. Um, some people say, well, well, I'm not, I'm not going to argue about it. Let's just say that the expanding universe and things constantly still being created, that's, that goes along with heliocentrism. The Bible says that God rested from the work of his hands and um, that uh, he made everything that was going to be made. Creation's finished. It's not an ongoing process. Now we're just living through history as events happen to creation. And that's what, partly what we're talking about in this video. Uh, we'll be talking about the cataclysms and things that have shaped this earth. So here we have the earth realm and the frozen face of the, the deep, or you could call it Antarctica. Now there is actually land around the periphery too. And we don't really know at this point how much land is, uh, is covered up by ice. The sun's circuit may have been broader at points in time. It's very possible that the sun and the moon are sort of spiraling inwards. I don't really know. Um, uh, but uh, at points in the past, there were areas that are currently under ice that were land and where people lived and there's civilizations and structures there. 
they can they're finding all kinds of interesting things on in, down in Antarctica, which is actually a ring around the world. Um, there's rumors that there's pyramids there and vegetation, animal life under the ice, um, human civilization at one point in time. It does not surprise me in the least. But uh, all right, so we've talked about how the sun moons, moves in a circuit. Let's talk about a local sun and moon. They are not, the sun is not one astronomical unit away from the Earth. What is that, 93 million miles or something like that? Um, and it's not this giant thing. No, it is small, local, it's smaller than the Earth, so is the moon. The sun and the moon are about the same size. They appear to be about the same size when you look at them in the sky, and the Bible lays out that they, they most likely are about the same size. Uh, Joshua 10.12 let me, uh, let me pull this up real quick. Joshua 10, verse 12. So there was a miracle where God um, gave a little bit more daylight to his people during a um, decisive battle. And he caused the sun and the moon to stand still. Uh, so Joshua 10, verse 12. Yeah, here we go. God gave them a miracle and uh, fought uh, for them with hailstones, killed more with hailstones than were killed with a sword by the children of Israel. But then, uh, listen to this verse, Then spake Joshua unto the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel's son, Stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. So notice that the sun and the moon have physical locations over the earth. Why is that? Because they're small and local. And notice that the sun and the moon are commanded to stand still. Why is that? Because the earth is already standing still. It's fixed. It's the sun and the moon that are making circuits over the earth. Joshua 10, 13, And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted, hasted not to go down about a whole day. God gave them more daylight by keeping the sun, which the Bible describes as a burning lamp, still over that particular geographic area. Fascinating. Now let's talk about the heavens, because the Bible says there's three of them. So let's lay this out. Um, so the Bible says that there's a heaven under the firmament. This is when the Bible says, you know, the sun's circuit is from one end of the heaven to the other and so forth. That's this area here under the heavens. That is the, uh, under, underneath this firmament structure, that's the first heaven. The second heaven is the angelic realm. Um, it is hard to exactly put a physical location on it, because now we're talking about things that aren't necessarily physical. Is it, does it exist alongside the physical reality, but just at a frequency we can't perceive? Maybe. So does it actually overlap where we are right now? Maybe. Or maybe it is physically above, because there is waters and a realm up there above um, the firmament structure. This is why there's that occult motto, as above, so below. Uh, this is why occultists and secret societies are in communication with entities that they call the hierarchy. And what's going on there? Well, there are spiritual principalities and powers in heavenly places, and um, kingdoms and empires. And some of these kingdoms and empires answer to Lucifer, Satan, the adversary, the enemy of the Creator, and our enemy by extension. He hates us because we are created in God's image. And, uh, and Satan holds sway over some of those principalities and powers. And because of that, he wants to mirror that, that um, hierarchy that exists in the spiritual realm here on Earth and extend his dominion and rule over humanity and the Earth as well. This is something that God did not intend for him to do. He's, he's, Satan is trying to take this Earth realm by force. And there are efforts, uh, people being influenced by demonic forces are they are working to open the um, the gateways between this physical reality and the spiritual realm and the Bible does say that the key 
that there will one day be a key that unlocks the door to the bottomless pit, and demons are going to come forth upon the earth. It's going to happen. Um, and so CERN and some of these black technology organizations, Google, who's one of whose goals is to create a uh, digital AI god, and they're using quantum computers, which actually um, kind of bridge the gap between the physical re realm and spiritual reality, and they're tapping into energy and resources in scientists will say in other dimensions, but we're really talking about the spiritual realm and accessing demonic intelligence and power to achieve some of these goals with, uh, with black technology. And then the third heaven is um, God's paradise. So three heavens, the atmosphere around our earth, the angelic realm, and then God's paradise. And the Bible lays out those three heavens uh, pretty clearly and consistently throughout. All right, so we talked about that. We talked about this a little bit. So outer space, I do not believe it exists. Um, people often show uh, the flat Earth under a firmament floating in space, sometimes even along with other planets in a solar system, in order to discredit what we believe, but understand that the idea of outer space and the solar system, heliocentrism, the heliocentric religion, we throw that out, along with, uh, you know, the rest of Big Bang cosmology. And let me lay something out here. There's this little thing here. When you find out NASA means to deceive in Hebrew, that's true. There is a word uh, that means to deceive or lead astray in Hebrew that sounds an awful lot like NASA. Um, that's a little bit coincidental. Some people put more stock in that than, uh, than I do. Understand that there are words in different languages that do sound alike, and maybe it, maybe this is coincidence. NASA is actually an English acronym, so it's not like they just... Well, I, I don't know. Anyways, I will say this, though, about NASA and some of these other uh, high-tech organizations. Um, they are steeped in occultism and, uh, and mystery religion. So NASA's predecessor organization was called JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It was founded in California by a guy named Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was an OTO Satanist who had um, orgies in his home and magic rituals with his coven or whatever um, in his home. And he actually died in his home laboratory in a lab, lab uh, experiment gone wrong. I believe there was an explosion. But Jack Parsons, OTO Satanist, that's the pred he's the founder of the predecessor organization to NASA. NASA is full of Freemasons. That's just the truth. There have been dozens of astronauts who are Freemasons. And Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator right now, unless it's changed recently, he's also a member of a secret society, Book and Snake. You can look all this stuff up for yourself. These people are not objective scientists. They have a worldview. They're not just objective and open-minded uh, materialists. That would be... It's an impossibility, really. Um, no one is truly open-minded. Everyone always has some bias, and everyone is inherently religious. It's built into our very nature. And, uh, but the Luciferians and secret societies, they're very careful to hold back the reality from the rest of us that they are religious. They, they want us to think that they're objective and rational and logical, uh, when in reality, they are operating on some strange uh, doctrines and dogmas that contradict the Bible. All right, so let's talk about how the face of the deep is frozen. So um, we don't really know beyond the Antarctic ice wall how far things extend or what lands are out there. There are many maps that depict other lands. So here's a ring that shows plenty of land where the Antarctic ring would be. Now, if any of these lands are real, now there there have been, this isn't a perfect map. This is a 1587 Urbano Monte, which is, it's incredible. It's an azimuthal equidistant map. Look at it. Look at it. It's incredible. This is fantastic stuff here. But there are some issues. For example, this is probably Australia down here. Uh, and notice he does show it coming up more. 
but it's not quite right as we know it. And so that would make New Zealand this. The shapes don't really quite seem to be what we're used to on modern maps. But then understand too that, um, so this is uh, Gleason's map. It's an azimuthal equidistant map, which means North Pole in the middle. And uh, the Earth expands outward from that to Antarctica, which is again, the ring around the periphery. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, um, you know, the absolute shapes of some of these things might be, might not be 100% correct on these maps. Understand something, that the crown or the governmental powers of this world have always controlled exploration and map making. Always. Always. Christopher Columbus didn't send himself to the New World. Uh, and these other explorers, Cook and Magellan and so forth, they're all being sponsored by royal families. And uh, Cook, for example, didn't even see his last two sets of journals published. He, uh, and so, you know, he died on his, on his third, um, third expedition in what were then called the Sandwich Isles, which I believe is Hawaii, if I remember correctly. And, um, and Cook didn't return from his third expedition. So, you know, coming back from his second, uh, he drops off his journals, and then posthumously his journals were taken back to Britain and then filtered basically through the Royal Scientific Societies. Um, who knows what kind of stuff they left out, and Cook wasn't alive anymore to, to gainsay the final published version that was finally approved for, you know, public uh, consumption. The world governments and royal families have always controlled the flow of information because knowledge is power. You want to know more than your enemies and you want your enemies knowing and believing lies. That's the entire premise behind the CIA. That's the reason why during Obama's administration, um, laws in this country that prohibited the use of propaganda against the American people were quietly um, uh, erased. And so now it is actually completely legal for the media and the government to lie to us. And uh, so the world governments don't really have much of a motivation to tell us the truth about the true face of our Earth. So this is kind of just a best guess. Or I should say this is Gleason's best guess here. And then we have Urbano Monti's best guess. But he does depict land in these other places. Uh underneath the ice of the Antarctic ring. Interesting stuff. Now let's talk about the AE map, or azimuthal equidistant. Um, so non-flat earthers have actually admitted, I have some articles about this somewhere, that north of the equator, the AE map is the best and most accurate representation of distances. And then the reality is that south of the equator it is as well. It's the best representation of distances because we used it for the World War II, the Pacific Theater. We used an AE map as the air map of the war because the distances are correct. And then you have to ask the logical question, well, if the shape that gets the distances best is this flat disk, you can't change the shape without changing the distances. Wouldn't that mean then that the Earth has to be roughly a flat disk like this? And I believe it is. That's a pretty pretty hard to refute argument right there, that this AE map is the best representation of what our Earth realm actually looks like because it gets the distances right. All right, well, let's carry on. The Bible says God has set bounds for the sea and that the face of the deep is frozen. Let's actually talk about the face of the deep being frozen first. Uh, so an image of that would be this, where it just shows ice extending outwards. This doesn't show the firmament. Um, we don't really know where the firmament boundary is. Uh, and the firmament is probably a dome-like structure. The Bible says that uh, God spread out the heavens like a tent. So it's probably like a dome-like structure or a tent-like structure. We don't really know how far it extends. Um, but uh, let's see, face of the deep is frozen, so we're going to go to Job 38, verse 30. I'll read that one real quick, and then we'll rewind a little bit. So the Bible says, the waters are hid as with a stone, 
and the face of the deep is frozen. So, you know, the waters are hid as with a stone. So there's something hard covering the face of the deep. It's ice. And uh, so, you know, is there land down there in Antarctica? But then beyond that, there's more sea, and then there's the firmament. And does um, the, firm, uh, the face of the deep, does the face of the deep extend beyond the firmament, like this image seems to suggest? So you have the firmament structure, but then the deep does seem like it, or, uh, you know, extends further out, farther beyond that. Is that how it is? Maybe. Maybe so. Um, God has set bounds for the sea. Uh, this is at the beginning of Job 38. Let me just read this. God is asking rhetorical questions of Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who has stretched the line upon it? In other words, what are its dimensions? Can you tell me? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? The Bible does say that there's pillars and foundations to the earth, but what are they fastened to? Who knows? Who knows what's down there in the depths? And who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So understand that the morning stars or the sons of God, the, the heavenly host, these spiritual beings, there were some of them that witnessed parts of the creation process. So they were created before humanity. We're, we're going to talk about the sons of God when we get uh, a little further along. So... Uh, I'm just checking to make sure that we're still recording here. All right. Or here we go. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made a, the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it. And break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. This is, uh, this is interesting stuff, and now that I'm looking at it, remember that the scriptures tell us quite clearly that, well, Jacob saw this ladder uh, that angels were, or a staircase. Um, I forget the exact language of the scriptures. It was either a staircase or a ladder, but what it was, we don't really know. Was it some kind of elevator system? Was it some kind of energetic, you know, like uh, in the Halo video game, there's this alien mothership with a tractor beam that goes up into the mothership, and at one point your your character, the Master Chief, has to fight his way to the tractor beam, and he and his team are all sucked up into the mothership. Is that what we're talking about? Understand that a lot of science fiction has been inspired by the scriptures, for sure. But anyway, um, so bars and doors. Uh, when we look at this, where the firmament structure meets the surface of the Great Deep, are there actually more... Uh, architectural features there um, because understand the firmament is God's handiwork uh, it's an engineered masterpiece um, with windows and other features and so perhaps there are gates like locks around the periphery that are actually keeping the deep from breaking forth and uh, beyond the firmament the level of the deep might actually be a little bit higher than what's inside and so you know is there a system keeping water from flooding in. Uh, but then there's the other argument that actually the ice itself is the the bars and gates that are keeping back all this water and, and creating these boundaries for the seas that the waves aren't allowed to go beyond. Uh, because there's ice beyond that point. There's no liquid water on the surface anymore. I don't know, but the language of the Bible is incredibly interesting and it's clearly not laying out a, a heliocentric... Um, uh, religious worldview. All right, so we've talked about bounds for the sea, the face of the deep being frozen, the sun moving in a circle, circuit, local sun and moon, earth in and out of the water. We've talked about the eighth celestial sphere, um, a solid structure into which the fixed stars are studded. So let's talk about the firmament real quick here, very briefly. I personally believe that the firmament, now there's different views on this. Uh, I know that some Biblical creationists who hold to a biblical cosmology in the flat earth view think that it's maybe some kind of lead crystal. That that's what the, the firmament's made of. Understand that the Bible says, I didn't pull these verses up, you can see them in my other videos, specifically the one about uh, biblical cosmology. But the Bible says that the, the sky is strong and it's as a molten looking glass. 
Um, so it is a glass-like or crystalline structure. And um, uh, so lead crystal, maybe, could be. I personally think it's super ionic ice. And what this is, is it's a water is a very miraculous substance. Uh, it does things that nothing else can do. But um, super ionic ice is a form of water where the uh, oxygen forms a crystal matrix, which is very blue and extremely hard and extremely resistant to heat. It can withstand temperatures of thousands of degrees. This is a form of ice that you just don't see normally in, in ordinary nature. And, uh, and then the hydrogen, you know, H2O, the hydrogen is freely flowing in this matrix of oxygen as free ions. Super ionic ice. It's uh, incredibly hard. Some people call it sky ice. And understand that in these Antarctica document documentaries, they're all obsessed with ice, ice, ice. And they're drilling cores and stuff like that all the time. And you can see that. Yeah, sure. But I do think that they're also obsessed with another kind of ice that you can only find down there, uh, which is, I believe they actually know where the boundaries of the firmament are, and that they're studying sky ice, or the structure of the firmament itself. And I've heard some really interesting accounts of them trying to dig through it, and uh, they're able to use thermal lances and stuff to damage it to some extent, but it regenerates extremely quickly, and they're not able to penetrate. Um, understand that people have been trying to escape the earth realm for a long time it's a, a form of rebellion against god this is earth is the habitation god's created and uh rebellious human beings want out they want to get out into the spiritual realm which i don't know that we're ready for in our physical state anyway it might not be survivable to be there but these people they don't want to be bounded by the restrictions that god's put on them and that leads us to this other thought we need to talk about operation fishbowl Nuclear tests um, in, at high altitude, uh, and you know, a lot of flat earthers believe that Operation Fishbowl was testing the boundaries of the firmament to see if it could be damaged, to see if it could be destroyed, to see if we could penetrate through. This is not the first time that people have tried to get out of the earth realm. We have the Tower of Babel, where the Bible says very clearly that uh, they were trying to build a tower to reach unto heaven, the second heaven. And God said, if I just leave them to their own devices, they're going to be able to do it. That does mean that, uh, that the firmament structure above us, it's not all that high. We could, in theory, with enough time, enough discipline, and you know, an entire new world order trying to get up there and get through it, maybe do that. And so God confounded the languages at Babel, and then that caused the people to be scattered. Uh, through the earth, which is what God had intended in the first place. But I want you to think about fishbowl, the connotations of that word, and there are four connotations. Uh, firstly, there's that expression, I feel like I'm in a fishbowl. You've heard that before. We're being observed at all times by God. Uh, earth is God's footstool. It is be beneath his throne. The firmament structure is described as a sea of glass beneath the throne of God. God, at all times, can see everyone, whether it's day, whether it's night, over their particular area of the earth realm. God sees it all. Nothing is hid from him. We are in a fishbowl, quite literally. Um, God can see it all. He's observing us. Uh, from his throne high above the North Pole. And uh, a fishbowl also has that connotation of containment. Um... The fish are contained. They can't get out of the fishbowl. Even if they could, they would not survive outside the fishbowl. There's the shape that's implied by the fishbowl, that it is dome-like or rounded. It's a bowl shape. Uh, and then there is also this idea of water. A fishbowl is used to contain water, uh, to hold back water. So a good description of our Earth realm, and, and by the way, atmosphere air, gas. Gas is considered to be a fluid medium as well. It's just a, a question of density. Um, so the atmosphere is a liquid medium, a fluid medium, and then the waters above and the waters below are more more fluid-like, more dense, more water-like as we, as we know it. But there's water all around us, it's, uh, fluid all around us. It's a huge part of this earth realm of our bodies um, and so forth. Uh, let's see here. I was going to say something else. 
Oh yeah, uh, so a good visualization of our Earth realm is that it's an analog clock with the sun and the moon representing the hands, kind of, the moon to mark the months or the months, and the sun to mark the days, so that would be the hour hand. Uh, so an analog clock underneath a snow globe. That is kind of a good way to describe the Earth realm in our flat Earth view. All right. The word antediluvian means before the flood, of or belonging to the time before the biblical flood. We have an entire word for the world before the flood because there was a flood, and there was a world before the flood. This is historical fact. Now, just like everything else in our modern world, the world is pushing an opposite narrative on us. So the word also means now ridiculously old-fashioned. They maintained antediluvian sex role stereotypes. Oh, which would be like, you know, uh, men should be masculine, women should be feminine, marriage should be one man, one woman for life, faithfulness and, you know, uh, sexual promiscuity is bad. Understand that uh, now in the world, all the truths that we used to hold to, all the values that we used to hold to, all the things that the Bible teaches, Big Bang cosmology basically teaches the opposite now. That is a sad thing. But let's talk about the antediluvian world. The world before the flood. So this is between the creation and the great flood of Noah. And uh, it's hard to even imagine how amazing and beautiful and terrible that world would have been. Um, now, initially, now that I think about it, so there was a... Um, a blessing that God gave to Noah and his family after the flood, which was that the animal kingdom would fear them. But in the fallen world, the antediluvian world, that may not have been the case. I don't know that that applied to humanity prior to that point. So everything we see in the fossil record, understand this. Um, evolutionism teaches that there are vast eons of time and life built up a little at a time. The biblical worldview is different. It says that everything that existed, God created. So at the end of that creation week, man existed and all the animals that God created. And those animals had within them, the Bible says, their seed um, within them and they were designed to reproduce after their kind. All the genetic variations that we see today were, con were created there at the beginning. And if anything, we've lost genetic diversity over time. But anyway... Um, so all the things, the great beasts, the the mastodons and the uh, chronosaurus and the plesiosaurs and uh, pterodactyls and anything you can think of these um, giant insects that we see in the fossil record all this stuff once coexisted with human beings these massive giant dragonflies whose wingspan was meters across these things once existed alongside human beings uh, everything was bigger, including people, by the way. Um, let's go to Genesis boo, 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 Genesis 6. I want to read. Yeah, so at the end of this period, at the end of the antediluvian world before the flood, things become so evil and wicked that God decides he's going to wipe the slate clean with this great flood and start over. But let's talk about this world a little bit. Uh, the Bible says, Genesis 6-4, there were giants in the earth in those days. That's interesting. And uh, there have been giants after the flood, too, here and there. Um, they're a little more rare. Um, but the reality is, no one his family may, may have been giants or much larger than we are today. I think life in general was bigger back then. And uh, the reason for this, so insects today, they have a certain limit to how big they can get. And the reason is a lot of them breathe through what are called spiracles or uh, air holes. And so they're relying on atmospheric pressure to push oxygen into them, into their tissues. And that does limit the size that they can be. You're not going to have, you know, uh, a six foot dragonfly uh, anymore. It, it can't happen. It would suffocate because the atmospheric pressure can't push enough oxygen into its tissues to sustain that size of insect that's breathing through spiracles. So, um, so we do know that the atmospheric pressure was probably much greater and the oxygen content was probably much greater 
back in the ancient past. And we can see from the fossil record too that things were much more tropical in terms of the plants and uh, the size of the plants and just the amount of foliage and things like that. It was a jungle out there and everything was bigger and people were probably bigger as well. And they certainly were living longer, some of them almost a thousand years, the Bible tells us. Um, and by the way, these giants were just normal giant people uh, because the Bible says after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So this is the Nephilim, but the Nephilim are after the giants. They're separate from the giants. Now, could you have, and we're going to talk about Nephilim theory in just a little bit, because um, this is important stuff. Um, whether you believe it, whether you don't, whether you're somewhere in the middle, like myself, uh, where you have some views on it, we're going to talk about this. But people were bigger. Everything we see in the fossil record once coexisted with men. Uh, this was a world of violence and death, and we do see that, that uh, because, you know, it was really wicked. Um, and uh, there's probably a ton of warfare. And it's very possible that they had high technology. We're going to talk about that um, a little bit later, but it's very possible that they had incredibly high technology um, that would make us envious today. There are ancient records, very old writings uh, in India, for example, that talk about um, anti-gravitic craft, electricity possibly, and nuclear war in the ancient past, nuclear weapons or something very similar to nuclear weapons, like weapons that were capable of destroying entire cities in one go, or just uh, vaporizing large numbers of people in one shot. Um, wars of the gods, basically, uh, some of these ancient Indian writings describe. So this was a very violent and dangerous world, and it was a world where people slowly were forgetting God because they were long-lived, they were tough, they were strong, uh, according to certain writings, the Nephilim especially were very arrogant and confident in their physical strength and their intelligence and uh, very godless people. So, giant people, giant animals and creatures. Uh, so let's talk about dragons. Um, dragons, like I said, anything in the fossil record once existed alongside men. So these dragon mythologies are just animals that still were alive after the flood that uh, were on the ark with Noah. And, uh, you know, today we call a lot of these as a class dinosaurs. That's kind of a misleading term because it implies that they were all lizards or reptiles, which probably they weren't. Some were probably sauropods, uh, some were probably amphibians and so forth. But um, understand that all the dragon mythologies were most likely inspired by real animals. Um, that, uh, and some of these still exist on Earth today. I do want to show you guys this. So this is Lake Tele uh, in somewhere in one of the Congos. I always get mixed up, but it's uh, some kind of crater lake. It's about two miles across. And uh, the Bushmen of the area, um, this is in deep, deep jungle. Very few whites have ever seen this place. Now, I've seen a few photos online of people who have gone here and taken photos in the last few years. But um, this is considered to be the ancestral home of the creature known as Mokele Mabembe, which seems to be a long-necked dinosaur that's a little bit bigger than an elephant um, and that has terrorized some of the pygmy tribes in, in this area. But... Um, I show you that just because there are still, I believe, dragons on Earth today alive. There's the whole Loch Ness stuff, which a lot of people are very skeptical about because there have been known um, frauds and fabrications of that. But understand that sonar readings of large creatures swimming in the loch have been taken on numerous occasions. One of them, just this last year, a fisherman caught some very strange things on side scan sonar, a guy who's lived in the area all his life and been fishing the lock all his life. Um, and even in the modern era, people are catching videos of things swimming just under the surface. We know that the northern end of the lock has a passageway to the sea, and it's very likely that Loch Ness is just a nursery area for young, 
and so there's probably not a large population of creatures in the lock year round they're probably just using it when they have offspring and during certain times of the year and the lock is very deep very deep and uh, peat filled water so it's hard to um, to really see too far underwater these are the Rhine's photographs basically some cameras were set up to uh, be tripped by motion and um, the Rhine's photos are real interesting there's a couple of flippers and then there's a couple of what appears to be um, they're not here I don't think in this particular article of what appears to be a torso and a long neck coming off the torso uh, but they're very kind of grainy and blurred because there is so much suspended peat and stuff in the water that it's hard to say exactly what's going on but it's real interesting and I do believe that these creatures because understand back in I think it was the 80s we found a, a, a coelacanth and now we know that the coelacanths which are bony fish that Big Bang cosmology says had been extinct for 70 million years uh, no they're still around um, they're just in places that people don't usually go uh, anything in the fossil record we could end up seeing and I do believe as time goes on God is disclosing more and more truth to turn people to himself I think that he's gonna reveal some dragons to us and I think it's gonna be astounding when it happens and I'm really looking forward to that because I've always been interested in marine biology but another element that we should talk about is giant trees the Bible talks about Nebuchadnezzar having a dream where he sees a tree that is so high that it can be seen from one end of the heaven to the other now understand you know in our um, uh, biblical worldview or our flat earth biblical cosmology that the earth is a relatively flat plane with land features so yes you could in theory have structures tall enough and big enough that you could see them from one end to the other but Nebuchadnezzar's dream now it was just a dream so you gotta take it with a grain of salt but at the same time the very concept of it doesn't make sense on a globe earth and uh, there's evidence though all over the world of things that a lot of truthers believe actually are the remnants of tree trunks um, now geologists say that no these are you know up thrusts um, from from geological activity and so forth that formed over vast eons of time but these structures and this is the devil's tower this is just one of them there's literally thousands of these structures all around the world unusual plateaus that when you look at them look like a tree that was cut off now understand that there have been major violent cataclysms there's a lot of people who say who cut down the giant trees well I don't know that most of them were cut down I think a lot of them were destroyed or blown over or buried um, during the Great Flood we're going to talk about just how violent that event was Devil's Tower is fascinating because see these little columns or fibers that go up uh, each one of them has a geometric shape I forget if they're six-sided or five-sided but um, yeah absolutely fascinating um, there's uh, someone had overlaid like done a comparison between um, plant stems and the structures you find in plant stems and the structures of this formation Devil's Tower I do think this is actually a, a tree trunk a remnant of an ancient tree and if that's just the trunk the tree itself would have been miles high astounding the world that existed before the flood was incredibly beautiful God made this this world himself um, and it was a, a masterpiece a work of art and uh, as I mentioned probably Adam and Eve were they probably were Giants it's a very it's a very real possibility and uh, as as we talked about from the scriptures Giants and the Nephilim are distinct let's talk about the Nephilim a little bit because um, and well, let's talk about Giants too because there are vestiges of Giants in the real world uh, in, in the modern world um, here's one from my neck of the woods uh, there's a mound here that I'm aware of in Tennessee uh, but East Tennessee and this whole region lots of burial caves uh, lots of burial mounds and mound sites so 
the mound builders are a very mysterious group in North America, and I'm going to give you a bit of basic background on them. So uh, a lot of the Native American tribes have oral traditions, including the Cherokee and others, of these mound builders. And according to the traditions, these mound builders were, um, there weren't as many of them as there were of more ordinary sized people. They were very strong uh, and they were giants. They were, you know, seven to eight feet in, in that window somewhere was pretty average for these people. They had double rows of teeth. Uh, we know this from some of these burials and many of them had red hair and they ruled over the Native American tribes. They ruled over the smaller people. And then eventually, because they were cannibals, and whenever they um, did these burial sites, they buried their you know, royalty. Uh, they were into copper working and stuff like that. But they buried their royalty with a lot of copper worked armor, jewelry, things of that nature, and also with uh, human sacrifices of you know, their subjects. And some of these mounds have had hundreds of human sacrifices in them. And there have been entire cities, uh, for some reason, Independence, Missouri keeps popping into my mind. Uh, but there have been a lot of cities, uh, there are modern cities that have been built on sites of these ancient mound builder cities. And there were literally hundreds of mounds at these sites before we moved in and, and destroyed the mounds and built over top of them. But, um, you know, that's, that's the, some of the oral traditions of some of these Native American tribes is that these giants were ruling over the smaller peoples for a long time before the smaller peoples got tired of it, rose up, and killed them all. And then in the Bible we see there are other traits associated with, um, for example, the children of Anakim, which was another strain of giants, uh, like six fingers and six toes, um, and vestiges of these ge genetic uh, some of this stuff still shows up today. I, I knew a girl in high school who she was born with six fingers and they had to surgically remove. Now it's hard to say, is this stuff really linked to uh, strains of giant DNA left in people or is it more genetic mutations? Hard to say, really hard to say. Uh, red hair is a, is a genetic mutation. Is that linked to these folks as well? Um, I, I'm not a, uh, a geneticist, so I can't really say with extreme certainty, but at least these associated characteristics are there with these folks. Um, and I think the giants in the past were bigger than the giants today. Things, as the oxygen content in the air goes down, as the atmospheric pressure diminishes and so forth, the world is vastly different than it was. Life is getting smaller, including people. Now, there's been a little bit of a reversal of that in the modern era, especially amongst Americans and first worlders, because we have so many growth hormones in our food, especially in our meats, and this is causing people to start getting bigger again. But during the Civil War, people were pretty tiny. I've seen, like, uniforms uh, uh, that have been preserved, and, um, you know, my little sister couldn't squeeze herself into... Um, into the uniform of uh, of one of these Confederate generals, um, whose name escapes me at the at the time, but I remember seeing his his uniform. Um, people are are getting bigger again because of the artificial growth hormones. Now let's talk. So that's giants. Let's talk Nephilim. So Nephilim's a little different. Yeah, let me. Uh, I'm just going to read these first four verses. Pay really close attention to the language here. And it came to pass. This is Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Okay, so generations of humans, normal humans, are already being born. Normal men are seeing normal women and having normal babies. Now I say normal, we're talking about humans. They probably were giants, some of them. Anyway, so this has already been going on. And then that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So there have been points throughout history 
for various reasons that the Lord has changed the expected lifespan. So right now it's about 80, um, sometimes a little longer if someone is, you know, particularly strong or healthy. But about 80 is the expected lifespan now. And then obviously much, much shorter in some of these harder, um, you know, more primitive societies where condi living conditions are tougher. But anyway, um, Look at the language, though. It's saying there were giants in the earth in those days, and after that the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And then we also see it came to pass when men began to multiply that the daughters of God saw the uh, sons of God saw the daughters of men. So humans are are doing human stuff. They're marrying. They're having kids. They're procreating. The sons of God seeing the daughters of men and having children with them are it's different. It's not just human men seeing human women and having babies. So who are these sons of God? Well, this term sons of God is really interesting. It always in the scriptures refers to um, a direct creation of God. So Adam is and Eve, uh, well, Adam was a son of God. He's a direct creation of God. Now we, the rest of us, are not sons of God for, for a number of reasons. Um, we do have the curse, so a sin nature, um, but we're also not direct creations of God. Now, other entities, we already saw a verse about the, um, the heavenly host praising God during the creation process, because some of them were there to witness that, these spiritual beings in the spiritual realm. These are the sons of God. That verse makes that very clear. These are spiritual beings, um, angels, we would say, although that word's overused a little bit. Angel specifically means messenger, and it refers to a human form type of spiritual being, uh, that uh, they are a spiritual being, but they look like men, and they walk among men sometimes. For example, when, uh, when God came in human form, Jesus Christ came in human form, the Lord, and he had two angels with him, and they visited Abraham before God sent those angels off as witnesses to the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of those cities. Uh, and they, they were able to, um, I'm pretty sure in Genesis, that when that happened, they ate because Abraham pr prepared food and stuff for him. Um, let me just, just go check that real quick. But anyway, the sons of God, direct creations of God. So Adam was a son of God. And uh, the uh, spiritual beings, including angels, were sons of God. And um, yes, I do believe that we had a mingling of spiritual beings with humans, and that's where what these Nephilim are. I do think that, uh, that that's clearly what's going on here, because <clears throat> these sons of God mating with the daughters of men is clearly different from humans having human babies from the context. And so there is this idea that there are these bloodlines mixed in with humanity. Now, humans are humans, whether you're, you got some Nephilim in you or not. And some of these bloodlines, it does seem existed after the flood as well. There's uh, a lot of thinking that Noah and his sons may have had some of this in them. Um, there's also think, I mean, it's hard to really say exactly what was going on with this, okay? It happened thousands of years ago. Um, but there are some angels, angelic beings, that are specifically reserved in chains until judgment for crimes that they committed in the past. And it's unclear exactly what those crimes are. The Bible doesn't say it outright, but some people have speculated that this was the crime of intermingling with human beings that this was not something God intended, and so that they had crossed some boundaries, and that for that reason, some of these entities have been specifically imprisoned for that crime. Very possible. And obviously these would be spiritual beings, angels who have rebelled against God, uh, and who have chosen to take up their lot with Satan, the one, the 33%, the one-third. Um, but uh, there's kind of a lot um, going on with this stuff. So could someone be both a giant and a Nephilim? Uh, quite possibly. Um, 
even though they do seem to be two distinct categories. And then there's thoughts that um, uh, the mighty hunter before the Lord, what was that fellow's name? Hmm. I forget his biblical name, but uh, he was, according to Josephus, he was the king of a one world society um, after the flood uh, and associated with the uh, creation of the Tower of Babel. Anyway, this guy, uh, a Gilgamesh um, analog, basically. Uh, this fellow is thought to maybe have had Nephilim blood. Uh, that's going to bother me. His name just slipped my mind. Anyway, let's continue on. And so those would be some things you could investigate in a little more detail. What Josephus says about uh, the Tower of Babel, for example, and uh, the king that was ruling over their one world society at that point in time. Um, because there's always been a drive, always, to create a one world order. And oh, whoa, <laughs> one world order. Uh, it existed, it seems, before the flood, um, not necessarily. But then it definitely exists after the flood around the time of the Tower of Babel. There was one society and they were all working towards one goal, to build this tower and, uh, and reach heaven. Um, anyway, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, if I think of anything else related to Nephilim, I did cover it here for some reason. If it occurs to me, we'll get to it a little bit later in the notes. Anyway, so things had gotten so terrible that uh, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart and he decides that he's going to destroy everything with a flood. But he saves Noah and his family alive, eight souls. And um, God decides he's going to destroy the, the earth by water, this great flood that's going to wipe out everything. And so we're getting into the great flood account now. So just to summarize it, well, let's uh, let's just zip on through. So Noah has three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and so Noah, his sons, and their wives are, um, they build this ark. Noah's preaching righteousness the whole time, and there's a lot of very interesting things that happen during this time period, but Noah's given instructions to... Um, prepare for all these animals and uh, the different archetypes, you know, like canines, felines, um, and so forth, that are going to be able to generate a lot of variety in different species, subspecies. And uh, they prepare, they build the ark, and uh, it says that God seals them in to the ark, and then there's 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but there's other stuff too. So the windows of heaven are open. That's your 40 days and 40 nights of rain. But then there's also all the fountains of the great deep being broken up. Um, there's all these ridges underneath the seafloor. Uh, it just looks like tears in, our, in, our, in the face of the earth. Some of these are called like the Ring of Fire, for example, because there's all this volcanic activity and stuff around these areas now. But it just looks like rips. And um, a good comparison to this is if you blow up a balloon and then you pop it with a needle, what happens is from that, that point of where you pop it with the needle, if you pick up the pieces of the balloon afterwards, you'll notice that the balloon tears it doesn't just explode into shreds. The balloon actually tears along the path of least resistance through that rubber balloon surface. And so you will get a few pieces um, that are still stuck together. And, and it's kind of like that's what happened with the Earth as well. There was pressure there and the Earth's surface just tore up and these fountains were all broken up. Now, I completely understand the very last class that I had to take um, to get my degree was an oceanography course. I understand there's all these theories about seafloor spreading and plate tectonics and things like that um, that I see as kind of more associated with Big Bang cosmology. 
uh, and go so far back in past in the past with these theories that um, you know they're not really able to be substantiated. Uh, let me just say that I think that personally that these were the fountains of the great deep breaking up, and uh, I don't have proof of that. I would say that it's a biblical theory or a theory based based on you know the the biblical the scriptures. And so what would have happened at these sites is, as these are breaking up, you would have had torrents of water just shooting out of these cracks from, from below. And the, the pressure would have blasted material, and not just water, but mud. Blasted mud and stone and material just high into the atmosphere. And... Um, this dovetails really nicely with a lot of videos that are going around about mud floods and Tartaria. Let's talk about this a little bit. So firstly, was there a global flood? A lot of people say, oh no, there couldn't have been a global flood. However, there's enough water on the surface of the earth to uh, cover it to a depth of two miles if all the land was leveled out. And 70% of the Earth's surface, 70 plus percent, is covered by water today. And then, of course, you have tons of ice. Uh, the oceans go deep, uh, eight miles, possibly deeper than that in places. We don't really know because it's, you know, obviously not an environment that's too hospitable to us. So, yeah, there's plenty of water to cover the entire surface of the Earth, um, just like the Bible said happened. And when you really start digging into it, modern geology says, no, there was no global flood, but there was a worldwide series of large-scale localized or regional floods. Come on. Um, they just don't want to acknowledge the biblical account. But we have marine fossils everywhere on Earth, from the highest mountain to the lowest valley. We have these strata or rock layers, which were probably more fluid and laid down by water. And then... Um, solidified into stone and uh, and the sifting action of water created these eddies that pulled in f dead bodies of certain densities and sizes and then formed these fossil graveyards that we see I've seen fossil graveyards out west uh, very impressive um, all of this was the flood that shaped the surface of the earth and really wiped out a lot of well, wiped out all, all of humanity that existed on the surface of the earth and a lot of the animal life. And I do believe this is where a lot of the great trees were destroyed as well. Probably they were just snapped off. Because you think of the tempestuous forces of water, um, not only is that eroding the tree's root structure and the ground that they're rooted in, uh, it's knocking them over, but there probably were winds generated um, and other things that may have just snapped the trees clean off like they would be during a hurricane or an eruption and um, yeah it completely reshaped the earth um, and we do see that you know there's thoughts that the Colorado River eroded the Grand Canyon over vast eons of time millions and bajillions of years or whatever well a few months of enough water running through an area could have carved out the Grand Canyon in a very short amount of time. And uh, we biblical cosmologists believe that, that all these, this massive erosion that we see all over the world, that this was caused by the flood and the runoff of the floodwaters. And you want to talk about mud floods as well. Um, so let's talk reclamations. So these people who are putting out the mud floods and Tartaria theories, they are onto something, I believe, and it fits really well into the great flood of Noah which is that human beings aren't necessarily always building these cities. We're often reclaiming them, like discovering these cities and then cleaning them up and reusing them. But they're actually from the antediluvian world. And in a lot of these cities, you see things like mud um, covering the, uh, the lower several stories of buildings, like they've been buried by a mud flood. Or let's rephrase that, uh, sediments deposited by massive flood water runoff. I have no problem believing this whatsoever. And we see, you know, these Tartaria uh, video content creators are pointing out that in a lot of places in the old world, you have these buildings where they seem like they were simultaneously designed for very large people 
and then ordinary sized people at the same time like you have stairs where there's normal staircases but then large staircases or areas where there's normal sized doors and very large doorways at the same time in the same buildings I have no problem believing that it, it fits perfectly with my biblical worldview that uh, this world was shaped buried uh, and the old world and its, its civilizations destroyed by the great flood of Noah and uh, and likewise I think a lot of these um, megalithic sites that we see were not necessarily um, For example, there's a theory, and I think it's pretty well proven at this point, or at least demonstrated. There's a theory that the Great Pyramid at Giza was not um, was actually an industrial site. It was a ram pump. It was a machine, because a lot of people don't know this, but there are these. There's this massive system of irrigation tunnels deep underneath Egypt, underneath large portions of the country. What was driving the water through these irrigation systems? The Great Pyramid, uh, this gravity-fed ram pump. There's evidence that there was a large water, uh, water reservoir at one point in time around the Great Pyramid with a retaining wall to hold it, and um, probably you know an offshoot of the Nile or something like that. Hard to say because it's unclear whether the Great Pyramid is post-flood or whether it's actually pre-flood antiquitech. But uh, then this. A ram pump just uses gravity to pump water, and um, people have, using using the uh, dimensions of the Great Pyramid, done scale models and made working ram pumps. And I think that demonstrates to me pretty clearly that uh, I'm sold on that idea. That yeah, that's what it is. It's a, a huge megalithic ram pump. It's an industrial site, and this fits with the reality that no one was ever buried in the Great Pyramid. And unlike the Valley of Kings, where these elaborate tombs that uh, where pharaohs actually were buried, these tombs were always covered with ornate tap uh, like hieroglyphics and uh, carvings and so forth, and probably painted as well. I believe um, the Great Pyramid doesn't demonstrate that there were no hieroglyphics or paintings or anything like that. Uh, there were maybe a couple incidences of um, of uh, ancient graffiti that may have been put there by workers or by people sneaking in at later times. But the Great Pyramid, there's no evidence whatsoever that, uh, that anyone was ever buried there. I believe it's an industrial site because there's also demonstration of high water marks and, you know, moisture seeping into it and stuff like that. I believe it's connected to Egypt's underground tunnel system and that it was driving water through that tunnel system and irrigating the nation basically back in the day. And what's fascinating about the pyramid being a ram pump, those who have built uh, um, scale models of it, um, an engineer did that for example, you can probably find the videos of that still on YouTube, but he says that if that's what was really going on there with the Great Pyramid being a ram pump, you would have felt the rhythmic thumping of that system for literally miles in all directions around it. And there's something else going on with it too. There's these resonance chambers in the upper portions of that pyramid, and it's thought that the pyramid had a metallic cap on it at one point in time. Um, there's a theory that not only was it a ram pump, but the, the cyclical pumping was generating these uh, frequency pulses um, that would blanket a large area and actually enhance crop growth. Uh, like they would be a stimulating frequency that the crops they were using would actually um, that would actually stimulate them to grow bigger and, and you know better. And if that's the case <laughs> The Great Pyramid is a masterful piece of advanced technology that we today uh, probably could not reproduce. Um, so this is Antiquitech. Uh, it's the idea of ancient technology that is very advanced. And there are vestiges of it left in our modern world. For example, the cathedrals. There's some weird stuff going on with, with the cathedrals. Um, 
and some of the things that were up there on the spires that we have pictures of but you know have been disassembled and removed for whatever reason there's some strange stuff going on with lighthouses um, a lot of lighthouses the mechanisms were had a power system and seemed to have been automated um, probably by the earth's electromagnetic field so that yeah there's some weird stuff out there going on with Antiquitech. Um, some of these ancient waterworks. Fascinating stuff to dig into. But uh, anyway, so the fountains of the Great Deep broken up. Let's talk about the scars of the moon and plasma mud uh, and mud pots and the Milky Way. So this is another theory of mine, uh, not provable, not proven. But I just want to lay it out there because I think it's really interesting. So these are mud pots. These are areas, especially out west in the U.S., you can find them in other places. You find them in areas of geological activity um, where gases are coming up through these boiling, well, it's what it is. It's a mud pot. And they're extremely viscous. If you've ever watched videos of these things, they, they plop as a big air bubble, uh, gas bubble comes up through them and then they hold their shape for a really long time. And I'm looking at these and they look a lot to me like what's going on on portions of the moon. And uh, understand that before the heliocentric religion brainwashed everybody, uh, there were scientists who believed that the moon was a viscous plasma, a viscous radiant plasma. And I do hold to that view. And so I think that... Uh, the scars that we see on the moon, I think there may be several different things that happen there. One thing that happened is, remember, um, these fountains of the Great Deep being under tremendous pressure and tearing open and blasting material high, high up into the atmosphere for miles, most likely. Um, did this material impact the moon and splatter it, basically? And then because it's such a viscous material, those splatters and damage are now recorded on the moon for all time from now on. Is that what happened? I personally think that that is a part of what has happened to shape the moon. I do. Um, now, it is just an interesting theory. Another thing we see on the moon is these I'm struck because I have a little target range where I shoot AR-500 plates, sometimes with a high-powered rifle. This is what you get. You, you, you get, it looks like someone shot the moon with a rifle. And so I'm looking at these ancient accounts from India where they're talking about city busters and ancient nuclear weapons and stuff like that. Um, are there also scars on the moon from possibly ancient warfare? Uh, or even modern warfare, because think about it. Uh, camera technology hasn't been around for all that long. Really good, reliable camera technology. So what did the moon look like 300 years ago? I strongly suspect, well, I don't know. I don't know, but maybe 300 years ago, some of these this scarring wasn't there. We know that they used nuclear weapons and tried to break the firmament. Really stupid, by the way, because if you hold to a biblical account, we know that there's water up there. If they're actually successful in penetrating it, that could be really bad. Now, I don't think that God's ever going to enable them to do that, or allow them to do that. He confounded the Tower of Babel for trying, for example. But my question is, were nuclear weapons or other weapons technology tested using the moon as a target to see what would happen? It wouldn't surprise me because the people who rule over us are, they get these weapons and then they just have to use them is really how it goes. Um, you can't just have a rifle and never shoot it. I mean, I'm a gun guy, so I know how that goes. I have a rifle. I, I want to shoot it. I love target shooting. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and then there's some people out there who, when they have a weapon system or something, they want to use it on other people, or they want to use it to destroy stuff in the natural world. It's just one of the more twisted aspects of human nature, I guess. So I look at some of this stuff, and I'm, I'm asking myself the question. I, because, you know, 
I'm not a heliocentrist. I don't believe in outer space as NASA preaches it. I don't believe that there's vast distances and things slingshotting around at ludicrous speeds and colliding with each other like billiard balls all the time. I mean, there probably is... It's hard to say exactly what's going on with the celestial bodies. Uh, and maybe there is some stuff that happens like that, but these are facing the Earth, and they look to me like weapons uh, impacts. And then we have ancient writings that talk about, you know, weaponry on a level of what we have on in the modern world. So what's really going on with this scars of the moon i think some of this stuff is sort of a mud mud pot um result of flood damage where rocks mud and debris were just blasted uh up from the earth when the fountains of the great deep broke and um scarred the moon splat and likewise i think that uh maybe some of this other stuff like uh, the Great Rift, the Milky Way and stuff, is this actually damage or material that was blasted up uh, onto the firmament itself? I don't really know. Uh, I guess some things that I need to look into in more detail before I really make up my mind one way or another. Um, does this stuff move relative to any one point on Earth? Or is it fixed relative to one point on Earth? Because there are thought, there were thoughts in the ancient world that the the, uh, the firmament structure itself moves, uh, which could be true, or it could be that the stars are an optical effect on the firmament structure, and so they move, um, but the firmament doesn't. Um, so there's a whole lot that needs to go into this whole line of inquiry, but it is a thought that I'm putting out there, which is did the fountains of the great deep blasting material forth from all these uh, ridges on earth did that splatter the inside of our firmament dome and cause some of these things that we see and they're not things out in the universe they're distortions damage or maybe even debris stuck up on the inside of the firmament dome and what's really interesting about that is this the classical greeks sometimes described the great rift as being the path of devastation left by phaeton who tried to guide the chariot of helios the sun god across the sky before losing control wreaking havoc and finally being struck down by a lightning bolt of zeus that's pretty wild and then phaeton uh is the son of the Oceanid Clymene and the sun god Helios. Huh. That's another thing that I'm just going to mention in passing is that uh, all these ancient mythologies, you have gods uh, or, you know, spiritual beings mingling with humans and creating these demigods, and then you're having wars between people that were instigated by gods um, and, uh, and so forth. This goes. This ties back to our Nephilim theory. Uh, is this stuff a reflection or a, sort of a legendary form of real events that were actually happening in the past, just being filtered through a different culture and a different worldview instead of a biblical worldview? Uh, and that is very possible. Uh, I just mentioned that in passing. <sighs> Moon photos are a bit frustrating because so much of it's coming from NASA and the other lying space agencies that you don't really know how much they're touched up. I believe this is a photo, though, by a guy who's amateur. I got it off a site. Um, amateur astronomer, I think, who just took it for himself. Um, but even with cell phones, it's tough because a lot of them, the cameras have filters and stuff like that. So, But, uh, yeah, like I said, there's... A lot of interesting features here. Did the moon get splattered with material from Earth during the flood? And then later on were perhaps weapon systems used against the moon? Um, to just to see, you know, what they could do. It surely does look like that to me. All right, well, let's... Um, here, I'll just show this in passing, too. This is uh, the New York Journal, 1897. This is another flat Earth map. published in a newspaper at one point. 
All right, let's continue on. Um, I think we talked about all this stuff. Okay, so after the flood of Noah, uh, people stuck together instead of spreading throughout the earth as God wanted. There was uh, a one world order that um, wanted to build the Tower of Babel specifically so that they could reach heaven. And that's really interesting. As a flat earther, I think that that's literal. That they were either working on some black technological device. Um, one of my pastors of a church I used to go to thought that maybe um, they were building some kind of uh, portal or something like that that could get them there. Others thought, no, they were actually going to try to build upwards. Um, unknown. But uh, the Bible's interesting because God, observing this, seemed to think that with enough time, dedication, and energy that they could uh, they could do it. And so he confounded the languages and created the nations, scattering the people throughout the earth. So let's talk about climate change, so-called global warming. So we can see from the fossil record and from what's under the ice of Antarctica that early Earth had a more tropical climate, probably higher atmospheric pressure and higher oxygen content that allowed things, including insects, to get much bigger. I mean, we got dragonflies that are absolutely massive. Now, I would not mind seeing giant dragonflies. I think dragonflies are pretty cool and beautiful. But seeing giant spiders and giant cockroaches, uh, yeah, that doesn't fill me with, with feelings of happiness. But anyway, uh, tropical climates, a very warm greenhouse effect, uh, there were periods of time, remember, in the Bible that rain didn't happen. And uh, instead, everything was watered with sort of this, this dew or mist that came up from the ground. Uh, which is interesting, because, you know, watering my mom's plants for her occasionally, she has these little pots, and then there's a tray at the bottom of the pot, and you, you put water into the tray, and then water gets drawn up by capillary action through the soil, into the pots. You don't have to water it from the top down. I understand the earth is in the water, standing out from the water, so uh, was it more effectively in the past drawing water up constantly from underneath? Um, anyway, so the Great Flood, when you dump a ton of water into a system, what happens? It cools it. Uh, we do this in the summertime when we get too hot. You you hose yourself off or pour a bottle of water over your head or put some ice on yourself. Water cools stuff. And then, of course, there's sweat, which is used to, when it evaporates off your body, cools you. Uh, well, dumping a whole bunch of water in the great, during the Great Flood onto Earth cooled the Earth dramatically. This triggered periods of glaciation or ice ages. There were many of them. Uh, glaciers, of which there are tens of thousands even today, um, they have shaped the earth. Uh, glaciers are really powerful. They, they expand and recede, and uh, they can scoop up boulders. They can actually scrape large areas of terrain down to the rock. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, so post-flood, yeah, there are periods of widespread glaciation or ice ages. Sometimes it's just called the ice age, but there were actually periods of recession and expansion of these glaciers. By the way, there are over 10,000 glaciers in existence. And uh, back around the turn of the century, around the year 2000, we had mass data on just like fewer than 100 of them. So these people trying to explain climate change and global warming with scientism is just kind of ludicrous when you don't even have good mass data on one percent of all the glaciers in existence it's just laughable to me the theories that these people come up with and then they seem to think that it's settled science or whatever bottom line is climate change has always been going on um but it's not primarily man driven or I should say there is a natural cycle to it. Um, we are finding out more and more that there is geoengineering that's been going on for about 100 years now. And uh, that's alarming because it's the world government's doing that. It's not, you know, ordinary people at our level and 
consumerism and you know driving a car so much uh, but like cloud seeding and manipulating storm systems and using frequencies to mess with the weather that's going to have far more devastating of an effect on uh, the ecosystem than anything that an individual is going to be doing but the long and short of it is earth so i guess you could say there's a balanced view there that yeah the world governments and their geoengineering is affecting climate probably and causing some instability and destruction uh, but the earth is equalizing back to its natural state uh, natural tropical state and that doesn't worry me i'm a warm weather guy so i say bring it on what does worry me though is the geoengineering that's destroying the protect protective layers of our atmosphere and causing us now to be uh, experiencing more and more cancer causing radiation here on the surface of the earth uh, and that's governments doing that kind of stuff and it's um not good need to let God be God and stop trying to stop the natural cycle and equalization of the world's climate. Uh, but that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to put stuff in the atmosphere that's reflective, to reflect the sun's heat, uh, to cool the earth, to prevent global warming. It's all a bunch of nonsense. People play in God and they don't understand what they're doing. Or they're intentionally trying to destroy things because there is that as well. There is a demonic and satanic agenda to destroy everything that God has created. And uh, anyway, so there is a worldwide conspiracy to cover up true history. There's a channel called Bright Insight on YouTube. Um, and uh, he's a fairly young guy, um, very well-spoken, obviously very intelligent. He's traveled a bit to... Egypt and stuff because he's really interesting interested in Egyptology but he's been covering a lot of uh, I don't think he's a Bible believer unfortunately maybe he'll get there at some point but he is a truther and uh, he's been covering this that the WEF is really flexing their influence around the world and destroying archaeological sites especially temples and really old stuff and they're destroying these by you know the temple will be discovered partly excavated and then the WEF takes it over basically cuts off all funding for any kind of real archaeological surveys and then they will plant groves of trees over top of these pyramids or structures and they will plant these groves with the intention that the root systems will go down and be destroying the structure they know that that's exactly what's going to happen and um, bright insight in a lot of these videos especially these ones about cover-ups and um, these up these disturbing updates from sites and stuff like that. Uh, he points out that the WEF is really pulling strings to erase our ancient history. And it's intentional. It is very intentional. Um, he's also done a lot of great work on the Eye of the Sahara and how it could very well be the Atlantis. Uh, it may have been real. The Eye of the Sahara is its a fascinating, uh, yeah, fascinating stuff. Anyway, um, there is a conspiracy to conceal truth from people and to cut people off from God because the people, Luciferians, um, these secret societies that have been around for a long time, very connected, very powerful, and they do serve the hierarchy, um, these spiritual principalities and powers that answer to Lucifer, and they are constantly trying to give us a false history of our world system. Well, thank you for paying attention. I hope you found this to be interesting. We talked about quite a lot of different stuff. Um, I may at a later date do a video on future events biblical prophecy uh, unfolding around us now and some of the cornerstones of biblical prophecy and what things are going to happen to the earth in the future including the people here on earth but i'm not really ready to do that just yet and uh, prophecy is even harder than trying to reconstruct the past because we're talking about things that haven't happened yet but anyway you can tell i'm losing my voice a little bit so i'm going to sign off um, have a good one.